Thank you, uh, uh, National Press Club uh, Australia, for inviting me again. I've been here several times over the years, uh, even when I was uh, unemployed. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you uh, uh, welcome me. I have a terrible sense of humor. A few, uh, a year or two years ago, uh, I was in Melbourne, Victoria Uni. I walk in, I said, I was among the, uh, the earliest to arrive, I sat uh, front row, and there was a young Asian uh, student behind me, and uh, she asked, uh, <coughs> uh, I greeted her, and she asked uh, what I do, where I came from, and uh, so on. I said, well, you know, I'm a homeless person. I live uh, outside. Uh, usually I uh, sleep, rest at the gate of the university. The very night, they let me stay there. And when there is an event, they invite me to come and uh, attend. <laughs> anyway, then came the presentations. Uh, you know, someone introduced me and uh, called me to the podium. The poor uh, lady, uh, the poor uh, student, was so embarrassed. <laughs> uh, anyway, but uh, you know, uh, former uh, late foreign minister Ali Alatas, Indonesia, great diplomat. We became friends in the end. Um, but once uh, annoyed uh, about me, uh, annoyed with the media, always asking uh, whether he was going to meet me or not, etc. That was in Geneva or in New York. He answered, Ramos Orta is an unemployed agitator. <laughs> uh, when actually I look at uh, uh, the definition of uh, unemployed agitator, there. he was right, actually, because I didn't have a salary. So by definition, probably that's it, because he was unemployed. Agitator, yes, that usually, uh, that's what usually I did. So I was uh, very pleased that even when I was an unemployed agitator, the National Press Club always invited me to come. We are back uh, long, uh, my, Twenty years ago, I was here, uh, and today I just want to share with you where we are 25 years after the referendum in Timor-Leste, uh, and uh, the successes and the failures. Uh, even the, su the successes, some in the Australian media, uh, Trying to uh, uh, because they disappointed, they disappointed that after all uh, they turn out to be wrong in their uh, prognosis about the future of Timor Leste. That irrealistic, it would never be independent, blah blah blah, all of that. And then we became independent. They get very disappointed, embarrassed, and then they try to prove how it has been a mistake after all. Failed state, etc., etc. Anyway, let me tell you facts uh, about Timor-Leste today. A, we are at peace with ourselves, with our neighbors, with the world. We pursue a process of national healing, Wound, uh, healing the wounds of the past, the wounds of the body, easier to heal, uh, heal the wounds of the spirit, of the mind, of the soul, much more difficult. But we succeeded. I have traveled around the world, 135 countries, and I don't, when I travel, I do study. Before I go, during my time there and after. I've been to Bosnia way back soon after the war. I was invited there. I was in the Middle East. Uh, Ambassador of Palestine is here. Palestine, which we recognized in 2004 as when the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, declared independence. We recognized, established diplomatic relations. <laughs> and uh, being there it, to Israel, I met with uh, Shimon Peres, invited me, I went. We were friends, I met with Netanyahu, uh, 
We met with someone I watched on television. I would never want to meet this guy, uh, the then foreign minister, Lieberman, uh, foreign minister Lieberman, who apparently before he went to migrated to Israel, he was a nightclub uh, uh, security uh, in Moscow. I met with uh, uh, the head of Knesset. I met with Ehud Barak, the then leader of the opposition. I think he still is. Met with the head of the whole uh, Israeli Navy. And as it turned out, I was surprised. He was Chinese, ethnic Chinese. But he was Israeli, he was Jewish. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, then I insisted with the Israelis, I want to go to uh, Palestine. Initially, when I first approached, they, they were not very impressed. And they said I would have to go to Paris, to Amman, and then fly. I said, listen, I don't have a, a, a special plane. And, uh, and uh, we are friends or aren't we friends? So just let me go. And they allowed. So then I went, and uh, Timur flags, hundreds of Timur flags were all uh, on the side of the streets from the airport. From the, the, the security point where I was dropped by the Israeli security, hand over to our friends, ambassador, Abdallah, received me there, and then to meeting with uh, uh, <coughs> the Palestinian leadership, including Abu Mazen. Been to Guatemala, Central America, been to Southern Africa. I did hostage mediation in 97 in Colombia, in the jungles of Colombia. 15 hostages had been taken by ELN. And then I was asked by UNICEF, so long, that's before Timor independence. I managed to secure their release. Uh, and when I met with them, I, I'm making the story very short, you know, because it was more convoluted than that. <laughs> and uh, I told them, I said, listen, I'm not an American, I'm not German, uh, I'm not Japanese, and this is only to say, I have no money. So I'm not going to pay you, because uh, both FARC and the ELN, uh, m part of their business or their main business is kidnapping for ransom. And uh, well, I secured their release without pay any ransom. If you have time, patient, to Google, uh, you can find a, a Google Washington Post. There was a story on Washington Post about my expedition there. In uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, 94, July 94, I entered Myanmar illegally. I went to Thailand legally, but then I exit Thailand without going through immigration. Went to Chiang Mai, Chiang Mai to Mesoit, then down to the river, up the river in Kano, and landed in Karen territory. There I conducted with some colleagues the first ever human rights democracy training program for the NLD, the ethnic nationalities, and so on. So I know Myanmar like very few people in, on this earth. <coughs> so <coughs> familiar with all of these situations, and I can say comparatively where we are, where we were, comparatively with other situations I have uh, been to, and I have to say, we have uh, done very well against what, what it was in 99, 25 years ago, utter destruction, a conflict, bloodshed, not only Indonesia and Timor-Leste, no, among ourselves, Timorese. So many Timorese killed by other Timorese over the years. Shanana Guzman, who is the real leader of the country, I was only on a briefcase, attaché case, uh, carrying it in New York and uh, elsewhere. As Ali Alata said, I was an unemployed agitator. <laughs> so I, I, Shanana, with his authority, 17 years in the mountains, valleys, uh, caves of Timor-Leste, reorganizing, leading the resistance. Then he was captured. Then he turned the prison into a forum, an international forum. Uh, at one point, Ali Alatu was furious because uh, he, he told the media at that time, he said, 
Uh, it almost like CP9 is the foreign ministry of Indonesia now. <laughs> foreign delegations arrive, the first thing they ask is they want to see Shannon, <laughs> and instead of coming to see me, that for the earlier letters. So he's the one with that authority, he called for reconciliation. And it has been one of the most successful post-conflict uh, uh, <coughs> reconciliation process ever. In 2015, I went back to Colombia, invited by President Santos of Colombia. He had done the, the peace agreement with the FARC, but then he made a fatal mistake, like uh, many others make a fatal mistake. You put, they put this very complex uh, process into a referendum. Of course, in uh, Colombia, they voted no. And the, uh, the people rejected that peace agreement with uh, FARC. He asked me, how did you do your reconciliation process? It was very well known in Colombia. I said, we didn't put it to a referendum. That's what leaders are about. Shanana, with his authority, he said, no uh, prosecutorial justice, justice of the victors, of the winners, against those who lost. Anyone who did not commit violence in the past throw, cast the first stone. And if we are going to start trials, Start, let's start with ourselves first, and then others. So, I explained that. And uh, since then, not a single Timorese has been put on trial because of the past, uh, past uh, position in the, in the struggle. So the country is at absolute peace, peace with ourselves, the best possible relationship with Indonesia, and I have to say here, for, for record, and because it has not been said enough, and I, uh, I, I consider myself guilty too, because uh, I should have nominated B.J. Habibi, the transitional president of Indonesia for the Nobel Peace Prize. In my record in nominating uh, people for Nobel Peace Prize, I have been reasonably successful. I nominated Muhammad Yunus, twice, second time he won, Prime Minister now of, uh, of uh, <coughs> Bangladesh. I nominated Kim Dae-jun, he had been nominated many times. I wrote his nomination in a hotel room in Seoul with his senior policy advisor, Han jung Kim, Professor Han jung Kim, and the following year and he won. I nominated Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter had been nominated many, many times, but never succeeded. Then uh, one member of the Nobel Committee told me, yeah, why don't you nominate Jimmy Carter? I knew they were just waiting for me to give the green light. Because, <laughs> uh, no, I explained to you, I explained to you, because he had been nominated many times. But the Jimmy Carter was very, very much criticized in the past, because it was during his administration that weapons supply to Indonesia went up 100% in the first year alone, by 1977. Noam Chomsky wrote substantively about it, and Nobel Committee was worried about it. I said, well, I cannot judge a person because of one of his policies. No, the man since he left office has been an extraordinary leader, extraordinary human being. I will nominate him. So they just waited for that, you know, that there will be no controversy. So I called Jimmy Carter's office, I said, I have, I, I have a reason to believe that this year, next year, he will win the Peace Prize. I need information on his mediation, also on the Carter Center, on human rights, democracy, and so on. B.J. Habibi deserved that. He was a weak uh, president, weak in the sense he was not elected, he was vice president under Suharto, he took over a, a point when Suharto was uh, invited to leave uh, the presidency by the military. But he, with his advisor, um, uh, Dewey Fortuna Anwar, a brilliant academic who advised him, first, 
move on with resolving the conflict of Timor-Leste. And I remember I was in uh, Atlanta at that time, visiting friends in uh, CNN. I had many friends in CNN headquarters in Atlanta. They called me to, uh, to go there for two, three days. I went. And then one of the journalists came to me and said, Jose, Jose, come, come. Uh, uh, President Habibi is talking about Timor-Leste. Habibi was talking to a group of Indonesian investors. He said, by the end of this year, I want the problem of East Timor resolved because I want all of us, Indonesians, to focus on developing other provinces. And he added, this East Timor is very poor. It has only rocks, has nothing else. <laughs> Actually, years later, when I traveled back in my country, rocks everywhere, I said, God, Habibi was really right with <laughs> <laughs> these rocks everywhere, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, but not only that. He pursued the democracy movement in Indonesia, the uh, reformasi. Habibi and the military, the TNI, they could have done what uh, the military in Myanmar did several times. And other dictatorships have done over the years in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. And what would have happened? What would be, have been the international reaction? You react sometimes formally, first hours, first few days, and then realism, real politics set in, and forget about the people who were denied democracy, were denied their freedom, so uh, trade, business, and then we hear all kinds of uh, arguments about, well, you have to be realistic. The best way to help the people on the ground is to engage the, uh, the regime, et cetera, et cetera. But the TNI and Chapeau to them, they understood the winds of change. They encouraged the process to move on democracy in Indonesia. They didn't become an obstacle. And Indonesia changed beyond recognition. Uh, <clears throat> so the best possible relationship in our, on our, in our own country, reconciliation, healing the wounds of the body, of the soul, normalized relations with Indonesia, and in 2025, we will be the 11th member of uh, ASEAN. First, thanks to the normalization of relations with Indonesia. Thanks, obviously, to the fact that we created the condition of peace and security in the country. And we thank profusely the international community, our neighbors, Australia, New Zealand, and all others. Because uh, sometimes it uh, when you have a, a choice of bad neighbors, then you are in trouble. <laughs> Very difficult to build peace in your country if you have bad neighbors. So you have, better, you have to choose better than neighbors. <laughs> of course, I'm being uh, sarcastic because you cannot choose neighbors. You might be able to choose friends, but you cannot choose a neighbor. You just have to know how to manage relations with a neighbor. And we have been fortunate to have a two great neighbors, Australia and uh, Indonesia. And beyond that, of course, uh, these two are the physical uh, neighbors that were much closer. But we have been able to develop also relations throughout Southeast Asia with all the ASEAN countries, then North Asia with Japan, South Korea, China, and uh, do not forget emerging superpower India. And uh, domestically, in 2002, we had only one PhD. Today, we have uh, over 100. Very few in Timor-Leste, because PhDs were awarded only very recently, and only one or two. They earned PhDs in Japan, in South Korea, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Europe, in, uh, even in Germany, uh, in uh, uh, United States, hundreds of master's degrees in Timor and elsewhere around the world in different fields. We had only 19 medical doctors in 2002. Today we have 1,200, 300 medical doctors. Most of them trained in Cuba, 
but they completed the training in Timor-Leste. They did only three years in Cuba, two years in Timor-Leste. Uh, medical school was established by President Fidel Castro. At the time, I was very skeptical about a medical school in Timor-Leste, but it's credible. Uh, our medical doctors who accompany our patients going to Jakarta, Singapore, and uh, the doc well, you have Dr. <coughs> Witting, uh, uh, Nitin uh, here from uh, Tasmania, but originally from India. He's been already in Australia more than 30 years. He set up the East Timor Eye Program, the first Timor optician, not optician, uh, ophthalmologist, through him trained at the uh, Sydney University, uh, Dr. Marcelino. Mm -hmm. Many more have been trained. They have done hundreds of uh, uh, cataract uh, surgery uh, now. Now we were doing daily in uh, Timor-Leste. We had uh, <coughs> electricity barely in Delhi. Only in Delhi and very barely. Today, cover 96.1% of the territory, and that data from 2021. Maybe currently, I would say maybe 98% uh, of the territory. Of course, not a great uh, power supply because it's based on diesel. Very expensive. We are trying to move to gas, slowly also into solar and other renewable. But for renewable, it will take more some de uh, decades to uh, to complete. We have had uh, a life expectancy in uh, in 2002 at Independence was less than 60. Today, about 70. And I hear all the time. I I don't understand, <laughs> dear Excellency, dear friend. When you are journalist, you know, you go to a country like if. I go to a country, I read, I research. And nowadays, very easy, you go to Google, no? And you get all the, I sometimes I even ask my four-year-old uh, grandniece, she's the one who Google things for me. And uh, I've complicated economic studies, I ask her, Sarah, can you Google this for me? And then, of course, I, I just give her two scoops, ice cream, and she's happy. <laughs> and uh, instead of paying, you know, thousands of dollars to a consultant. <laughs> a consultant, a consultant who also just download the, from the same source as my, my niece does. And, anyway, I, I was going to, uh, the other day, a journalist asked me about, to talk to me about unemployment in Timor-Leste. God, she cited a figure. I said, listen, okay, let me read to you unemployment here, you know. Um, unemployment, first let me clarify to you what unemployment means. For not, some of you here probably didn't study economics, so you might not know. Unemployment refers to the share of the labor force that is without work, but available for and seeking employment. That's quite obvious. Timor-Leste unemployment for 2022 was 1.79%, a 0.55% decline from 2021. Timor-Leste unemployment rate for 2021 was 2.34%, a 4.45% decline from 2020. So I don't know where they get all these figures, 20%, 25 <laughs> They just made them up. Because if they go to Google, you cannot find these figures. And, uh, and youth employment, they talk about 50% youth. <laughs> Excuse me, we have 40,000, 50,000 university students. In 2002, we had one university uh, with only less than 10,000 students. Today, we have a. 18 universities, of course, I have to say, I disagree with it, too many. Singapore, which is a superpower, has only five universities. Laos, similar to Timur in terms of uh, economics, three. We have 18. Uh, we open up universities like you open a, a takeaway uh, <laughs> <for> business. <laughs> and uh, I'm totally against it. But anyway, <laughs> we have that, and the total, total population is, uh, student is about to 40,000 if you count the active students. If you count those that are not active, it's up to 60,000. Thousands in Indonesia studying, 
officially 4,000 Timorese studying in Indonesian universities. Then count uh, in Australia, in Europe, where can they get this figure of 50% youth unemployed? Just mathematically, statistically, it's not possible. <clears throat> we have a zero ethnic base or religious base tensions. They were less than 99.6% Catholic, small number of Muslims and the Protestant living side by side in perfect harmony. So that's where Timor lasted 25 years after the referendum. I say that, share with you, but also because friends in Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, across the world, in Europe, in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy, in Ireland, in the United States, friends in the US Congress, who for years battled with us, supported us, they want to hear the good news. Uh, and because people spend so much energy, so much faith, you know, in the Timorese people's right to self determination and then when independence comes, civil war, violence, uh, uh, corruption, yeah, it's a thorough disappointment. So we have not failed our own people, we have not failed our friends. I will be, uh, our, uh, we are also very active internationally. His Holiness, the Pope, Papa Francisco, came to Timor-Leste from arriving on the 9th and left on the 11th, on the 12th. And uh, I told uh, our people, the ones in charge of organizing it, and I said, if we manage well the visit of the Pope, we can manage uh, ASEAN ministerial or head of state summits. <laughs> so, and I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, I was surprised how well we did. I was worried during the preparations for basic things like dehydration of people all day long, two, three days before they start coming. People were there six in the morning, four in the morning, waiting for a mass that's going to start only at 6 p.m. I said, there cannot be lacking of drinking water for the people. There will be problems with dehydration. And how about toilet facilities? We are talking about the estimate was 600 to 700,000 people. And how about food? To all these people camping everywhere. None of this happened. With no dehydration problem, enough water, <laughs> enough food, enough toilet. Uh, I have to say here, I thank Australian government. Australia responded very fast, very effectively in helping us with uh, uh, some of the basic infrastructures, including a hospital, uh, 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 an air hospital, airplane hospital, uh, ready for a evacuation of anyone that needs to be evacuated to Darwin. Australian Federal Police, working with the Indonesian police and our police, did a fantastic surveillance of the whole area, 24 hours. No, nothing suspicious would have escaped. Afterwards, they briefed me, and, uh, I, and I thank them for that. Tremendous cooperation between us. The more or less the police, uh, defense forces with Australia and uh, Indonesia monitoring the situation. The Pope left when uh, I was escorting him back to the plane and uh, I stopped at uh, the Guard of Honor. From there, he would be taken to the plane by Vatican protocol and security, but he touched my hand, hold my hand, and he said, come with me to the plane. I want, uh, so that you are, you are sure that I leave the country. <laughs> so uh, I went with him all the way to the lift, to the lift where uh, we would be uh, ending uh, his mission. And he looked at me uh, in the eyes, uh, he's very touched, and he said, uh, bien, 
de este pueblo maravilloso. Look well after these wonderful people. And he said, I was never so well received. He meant only that, uh, of course, hundreds of thousands elsewhere, millions elsewhere, but the intensity of the reception he got from our simple people. So that's where we are 22 years. I was signal that uh, uh, time uh, is up. Any question issue that I left untouched, Gaza, Ukraine, China, <laughs> feel free to ask. Thank you and God bless you. President, thank you so much for your speech. I'm not sure there'd be many speakers who can give such a sort of detailed, illuminating and uh, entertaining speech off the cuff as you've just done. But I do want to ask you about China, as you've just invited. Excuse me, my pen. <laughs> and I want to take your perspective on China's position in this region and specifically, I guess, fears that some people have in this town that you are effectively leveraging China against Australia at the moment, sort of in relation to the Greater Sunrise Project. So I wanted to get your views on China and then, you know, the negotiations that are going uh, on. OK. A certain... Uh, uh, I, I say this, you know, sometimes in, I think in Australia, because not much really happened in Australia. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. In, in my country, in my country, even less happening, you know. The police, a police mistreat a local, God, it's front page news. Only because nothing much happened in the country. And uh, some minor incident, it was, so I always tell the journalists, yeah, nothing happened here, so you make up this. Uh, and in Australia, I think one that uh, probably more uh, capturing people's uh, uh, interest in uh, buying the newspaper and looking at the television is uh, if it involves uh, China uh, in the negative way. I think that's the, the only reason. Because, A, I would say the Australian uh, intelligence, Australian military people, and the politicians who are really, really informed, educated, uh, they would know <laughs> that uh, China is not in any shape or form imagination a threat to Australia, or least of all to the United States. And uh, it is an economic trade rival. Yes, uh, China steal uh, technology. Uh, who doesn't steal technology? And uh, it is spies. Yes, <laughs> you know a great. A British, uh, British ambassador, I don't mention his name, uh, and uh, <coughs> he, was, uh, he, he was in uh, West Africa, in Senegal, when I was the Special Representative Secretary General in Guinea-Bissau. And uh, then there was the issue of uh, espionage in uh, Australian spying on, uh, on the Timor uh, you know, uh, government. And uh, the, uh, the ambassador with, uh, with um, a British sense of humor, he said, God, if because of uh, bugging uh, phones, uh, uh, people would cut uh, relations, the U.S. wouldn't have a relation with any country because they bug everybody's uh, phone around the world. And uh, <clears throat> so for us, that is, uh, and if at all, if, if at all, the Australian intelligence continue to bug our phone or the Chinese, they would find it very boring, very tedious, because the only thing you end up finding out is Timorese politicians, leaders, badmouth each other all the time. <laughs> and that's what <laughs> it made them. So we, we don't discuss when high stakes uh, security issues with the Chinese. When I went to Beijing, uh, months of preparation of the work, President Xi Jinping had already all the briefing. I wanted to discuss most was agriculture how China can replicate in Timor-Leste the Chinese miracle of eliminating poverty, increase food production. And he 
responded very well. I did the same in uh, Vietnam with the Vietnamese. Please help us securing food sovereignty, food independence. And they are planning to do in a bigger way support to Timor in this uh, front. In regard to the rest of the world, yes, of course, there are sensitive issues of South China Sea. Uh, I, my, my view, my vision, yeah, of A, we base our position on UNCLOS, United Nations Conference uh, Treaty on the Law of the Sea, that established uh, exclusive economic zone for any coastal state, and when it overlap, you agree on medium line, as we did with uh, Australia. And we did so bilaterally, Australia and Timor Leste. We, we agreed both to bring in a, an independent commission appointed by the EUN. In regard to South China Sea, A, my vision, ideally, in a romantic world, would be a sea of peace and uh, cooperation. A sea of peace and cooperation. President Xi Jinping said, I agree with that, because they had read my co comments before. And, but I also said, solution to the dispute in South China Sea, because these are bilaterals, should be discussed bilaterally between the claimant states. To say that, uh, oh, this is not acceptable because uh, China would put so much pressure on these, each country that they are smaller, weak, that is patronizing to this country, maybe small, but they have an incredible sense of sovereignty, of pride, and the more pressure you put on them, they, the more they react, the more they resist. So uh, it's total nonsense, this argument. Because, and then I never read in my 50 years of study that uh, a multitude of problems, you bring it to some multilateral forum to resolve. No, you discuss bilaterally. The rules are there, international law is there, law the sea convention is there, you know the legal limit, your right, and so on, you negotiate. Uh, so anyway, uh, for us, excellent relationship with China, as excellent relationship with the United States. I know the US like few Americans know. I live 15 years there. I travel all over the country. I know Nancy Pelosi well. She's a friend. <laughs> the, almost the whole Kennedy family. I know Republicans. I know Democrats. <laughs> and, and, uh, so, a great friendship with the uh, United States, as with all of you. And the only security arrangements we have is with Australia. We have Australian military personnel there, police. Tenis. I don't know how many Australian military are there, maybe 30, 40 or more, I don't know even. Can you imagine if just we had one or two uh, Chinese military personnel there? No one would sleep in peace in Australia. <laughs> we, we, have a, we, have a, we have a Portuguese a military, Navy, police personnel there. So the only two countries that we cooperate on security is Australia and uh, uh, the Portugal. But we have a, a permanent uh, US uh, military presence, but they are Navy engineers. And I was the one who brought them to Timor-Leste when I was in my first term in office. I talked with friends in the U.S. Senate, in the Congress. I knew about the CBs, the U.S. Navy engineers. They are fantastic. And we managed to get them to come to Timor-Leste. They've been there now more than 10 years, doing great work. I even pleaded with America, please, can you increase the numbers? <laughs> they said, well, no, we cannot. Uh, they are we are overstretched with the Navy engineers, but they are very good. So anyway, uh, leveraging with, uh, on the greater science, yeah, of course, uh, you, you call it leverage, but we, say we look for partners. You know, if Australia doesn't feel like to, for different, we are totally understandable. 
then either we talk with the Chinese or we talk with the Kuwaitis, because the Kuwaitis, a private independent fund from Kuwait, they've been to Timor already five times. They said, we are willing to invest upwards $12 billion on the Greater Sunrise Project. And they said, we are not a Kuwait government fund. We are private fund. We are ready to do it. And they have met with Prime Minister Nana. They have discussed. So Korea, Japan, all the interest. So anyway, I think next question. Uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're waiting. Uh, my apologies. So. That's all right. Our first question is Simon Gross from Canberra IQ. Uh, thank you for your discursive, uh, entertaining speech. Uh, my question is about your country's identity. Uh, you're, you're now in your early into your third decade as a country. Um, it, it was formed when there was an emerging uh, groundswell of uh, rejection of colonial uh, heritage. You pushed against that tide. You gave your country a Portuguese name and you adopted Portuguese as an official language. I wondered if you could explain to us how that history and those decisions fit with the current uh, rejection of colonial heritage. Thank you. I have been asked this before. Uh, once in Washington, actually, a great senator, friend of mine, I don't mention his name, he was a wonderful human being. He was in the uh, House of Reps, Senate, Senate for 30 years, always and of uh, uh, winning the election, never lost once. Was he a Democrat or Republican? Pardon? Was he a Demo Democrat. Democrat? Very liberal Democrat, very good man. Actually, I can mention his name. Uh, he, uh, Tom Harkin from Iowa. Okay. Wonderful human being. He organized a, la a coffee for me with several senators, six or seven of them. <laughs> then, in the midst of all, he said, Jose, you know we love you. Every time you come here, you ask us, we always support you. But your choice of Portuguese for your language is an absurdity. <laughs> but he said it in such a way you don't get offended. He's such a sweet man. And uh, he said, this, if you chose English, you would jump start into 21st century. I said, at the time, uh, the war in Liberia was high on the media every day, front page. I said, Tom, are you suggesting that your former colony, Liberia, is already in 21st century? <laughs> and uh, I can mention any number of English-speaking countries that are not exactly in 21st century. I, I could mention some Spanish-speaking countries that are in 21st century, like Costa Rica. I can mention some, uh, uh, some uh, German-speaking countries. Are not <laughs> the Germans are doing very well without English. And all the Japanese, <laughs> you know. So uh, of course, you know, for uh, Anglo-Saxons, uh, Americans, Australians, I said it. You know, for you, Americans, Australians, uh, who, you people speak only one language. So you people get very confused when we speak many languages. So, Timor Leste, we are very, we are very good with language. We have actually four languages. Mm -hmm. Officially, Tetu, the, the national language, which today is 70%, 80% Portuguese vocabulary. We have uh, 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 Portuguese, and then we have uh, working languages. We have uh, English and uh, Bahasa Indonesia. English is increasing, expanding. People learning English on their own, particularly now with YouTube and so on, people learning. And the Bahasa Indonesia continues to be vibrant. I don't know how, how, what the percentage, but maybe 40%. I personally defend that in the future, looking at details, how to do it, I would agree to make Bahasa Indonesia an official language as well. Why not? English will take a long time because we don't have to make English an official language to use English. English is like a commodity. Everybody uses English. Our people are learning English. So, so that is, a, 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 for us, well, Portuguese has been there 500 years. And, but you know, nothing to do with the colonialism. In, in West Africa, which I know reasonably well, uh, you have French speakers like uh, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, etc., etc., and then you have English speakers, Nigeria, Ghana, and all the others. 
in Southern Africa, majority, uh, almost all uh, English uh, speakers. Uh, English, uh, the official language, they have their own local language as well. Uh, and then in Central Africa, again, um, a lot French. Uh, so it's nothing to do with colonialism, you know. English would be also colonialism if we look at that, but uh, colonialism left also very uh, many good things. One is the instrument of communication, which is language. Thank you. Andrew Tillett from the AFR. Yep, thanks, thanks, Jane. Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review and also uh, Vice President here at the club. Um, I'd like to ask about Greater Sunrise. And in, in Australia at the moment, we have a lot of um, environmental groups pushing to uh, stop approvals of new oil and gas fossil fuel projects in the country. Yet with Greater Sunrise, we're seeing your country ping, pinning its economic future on a gas project. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of, I guess, reconcile maybe the, the, the tension or the contradiction there between that. Uh, and do you feel that maybe that push to decarbonise might also affect the ability to get Greater Sunrise off the ground? Uh, all of us uh, who uh, have a, a you know, uh, understanding of uh, the, the gravity of the uh, climate change uh, challenges, the nefarious consequences of human activities over the last 100 years, we can see it on daily, we can see it in Timor-Leste, how the weather changed, the rain uh, season changed, uh, we know it is urgent to do. But uh, I start by saying, you know, Timor-Leste CO2 contribution is zero point, then you begin to write zeros all the way from here to the street over there, <laughs> uh, like maybe 1,000 zeros, still not our contribution to CO2. And the same like other small countries. Uh, for us, it's a matter of our development, survival, to continue with our non-renewable development. But we are already working on uh, renewable energy. I hope that our government soon sign a project. Uh, it is a, a private initiative, uh, uh, French and uh, Japanese, for a major solar energy uh, project. Uh, in Timor-Leste. They, uh, they are just waiting for the final signature of Timor-Leste. For us, it's also pragmatic to use renewable, because right now, uh, diesel costs us 24 cents a kilowatt, one of the most expensive in the world. While we do solar, it will cost uh, 4 cents or some, uh, 6 cents or whatever. So for us, it will be... Uh, but we want to develop Greater Sunrise and any other gas field onshore and offshore to guarantee us financial viability for the next 30, 20, 40 years. But same time, we are moving towards um, renewable. And I don't uh, criticize countries like the United States, Europeans, and uh, China, India, uh, because it's easy you know, to uh, to uh, blame, blame, yeah, but uh, uh, they are to blame. But who knew, who knew it uh, then? This is what it was available, is uh, we do. And because of that, the world also progress. Uh, medicine, science progress with uh, non-renewables and uh, so on that power all this. So, you know, let's stop with uh, you know, the finger pointing and agree what is the best strategy. And uh, one of the best is the financing of uh, the, the poorer countries to transition to uh, renewable. So if and when Woodside joint venture and Australia agree, we, I wait to see, I haven't seen yet that uh, study, independent study where, where the pipeline would go to Darwin or to Timor-Leste. I, uh, in my role as uh, president is very, I say, it's not ceremonial uh, you know, because you know, the president of Timor has some uh, significant uh, uh, authority. Uh, it is not like the president of uh, uh, Italy, or, for instance, or the president of Austria. And, um, uh, but in reality, I have a little uh, uh, to say in any decision on the greater sunrise. 
However, as a responsible person, I want to study thoroughly the independent the study to see what are the advantages of either option, Darwin or Timor-Leste. I want to see, because uh, uh, there are risks, there are certain th uh, situations that are unpredictable, some predictable. We invest now billions of dollars, and then what will be the price of gas 10 years from now, 15 years from now, with so much gas in the world? and uh, so on. Uh, so it has to be decision makers in my country have to be very, very serious about this. It cannot be, uh, it, it is, cannot be a, a political issue. This has to be purely economics, but based on a serious, impartial study that, we would, that would be persuasive in regard to one option or another. Thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Jedjets from the ABC. Uh, thank you for your address. Um, Mr. President, could I ask you about uh, Timor-Leste's apparent decision uh, to suspend acceptance of a Guardian-class patrol vessel from Australia? Now, this decision to delay or suspend acceptance has been interpreted, uh, rightly or wrongly, by some analysts as a, quote, warning signal, to use Damien Kingsbury's phrase, uh, from Timor-Leste, that security ties with Australia remain contingent and some suggest would be contingent on the outcome of negotiations over Greater Sunrise. They're suggesting, in other words, that you're using that as leverage as part of your efforts to try and convince Australia to do everything possible to convince the consortium partners to take the gas to Timor rather than Darwin. Can I ask, is that analysis that's been put correct? And if it's incorrect, can you say why Timor-Leste has made the decision to suspend acceptance of, or to delay acceptance of those two vessels, at least for now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, this speculation uh, could be accurate. Um, I have uh, no way of uh, knowing. I was not consulted. I was not warned by our government about the suspension or cancellation of the two patrol boats, because this was something that was ongoing for several years, requested by our side uh, and by two top senior military. Uh, but then, of course, there is a new government that came in, uh, led by Mr. Shannon. They suspended several other projects. They did not suspend only this patrol boat. Suspended a contract that had been awarded, signed already for the modernization, expansion of the Delhi International Airport. And finally, a year later, they uh, signed a, a revised agreement. It had to do with, at the time, apparently alleged inflated costs of the airport. Uh, the government thought that uh, for that phase, that period, it was too big, no need for this and that, so it signed out. They are reviewing now this solar uh, uh, project in, uh, uh, in Manatutu that had been agreed by the previous government, again looking at the, at the cost. But the cost actually, this particular project, no cost to Timor, and it's going to be very important because um, <coughs> Jap a big Japanese company is going to build a shipbuilding uh, yard in Timor-Leste, in that area. And uh, the, this, uh, this is a concrete project that has all the possibilities of underway to go, to go ahead. And uh, we need that, uh, that solar energy. Uh, with our current energy, it would make the shipbuilding uh, probably economically unviable, too expensive. So I believe that uh, I don't think that it has to do with uh, negotiation pressure because, A, to say in, in fairness, we never had a better chance than with the current uh, uh, prime minister, current government, Anthony Albanese, to find a solution that is more helpful to Timor-Leste. 
I believe when I, I, I think I'm right, I saw in the media some many months ago, the prime minister would have said, we want a, a solution that best serve Timor-Leste's interests. And I believe those in Cameron that make the decision, they are genuine, they are sincere, that they would support whatever decision, whatever option, based on a good, solid, independent study that would benefit the most more or less. Because Australia has enough gas uh, to sell and give away. And uh, it doesn't need the Timor, uh, the greater sunrise. And uh, my, uh, um, you know, my, uh, I have said many times, previously also here in this National Press Club many years ago, I say, and I think Australia side agree with that. Australia, in, uh, when look at Timor-Leste, it should look at it as a, an extension of its own national security interests, an extension of its own economy. You cannot be narrow-minded, provincial, and look only at your immediate uh, um, uh, <coughs> territorial waters or your, your medium line. You have to have a, a look at the broader region to have a, a stable, peaceful, and prosperous re, uh, re, region. And to achieve that end, you would have, adopt, have a vision, a policy that can make this vision a reality in the region. And that means do everything possible to make Timor more independent, more self-reliant, uh, prosperous, a friend of uh, Australia. Uh, that in the future would include uh, labor mobility, because Australia, like almost all the European countries, have a very serious aging population and uh, need a workforce. The Germans, you know, uh, I, one country I know well, I visit more often than almost any European country, Germany, because of many friends there. Uh, only a few years ago, in one year, they had to recruit 250,000 uh, foreigners, youth, for apprentices. They couldn't find locals. And uh, the same happened. Portugal has the worst uh, situation in terms of uh, uh, workforce. They don't have it. One of the worst aging population is Portugal. Italy is number one worst in Europe, is, uh, or in the world, is Italy. So uh, <clears throat> you need young Timorese, young Pacifics, uh, to help your economy, because help economy helping us. But have to look again at the work, workforce program, because it, although Australia has great laws, very fair, they, there is also exploitative practices. For instance, Timorese workers uh, have to pay for uh, boarding. Okay, that's fine, we pay. But uh, one person pay something like uh, 100 uh, uh, plus dollars for um, a, a week not for the room, for a bed. And sometimes that room has eight, ten beds there. And each person pay, uh, pay, pay uh, uh, like, uh, uh, I have here all the, all the data. It turns out like. Is that a specific case? A particular sir? dormitory for eight people with bunks turn out to cost a week $700, more expensive than Tokyo. And uh, so, exploitative. And they have to pay for the bus transportation. It's not like, you know, you have a Greyhound bus with air condition and television, and you pay to go to work. In my own country, Heineken Beer Factory, the, com the company has the bus, ferry workers from the city to the beer factory. It's part of the work, uh, part of the company. They don't pay for the transportation. 
Here, the people have to pay for transportation, the workers. They have to pay, we pay around, Timorese workers pay around 31 million Australian in taxes each year. This is 37 percent of Australia's 83 million budget to Timor-Leste. 3,800 Timorese workers spend $90 million on annual living, annual living expenses in Australia. So we need that. This program help us, help our economy, but uh, it has to change. It's un unfair. That is exploitative. Timorese people living in the UK, and it is not a program like this. People went there. Now we have 30,000 Timorese in the UK, of which maybe 20,000 are working. Last year, December last year, they sent, up to December last year, they sent $110 million to their families. Far better than foreign aid. This kind of work program better help our, help our economy than the so-called ODA. We have time for just a couple more questions, but just on the Palm Scheme, so you're saying it's exploitative. Have you had any recent discussions with the new IR Minister Tony Burke or the new Ag Minister Julie Collins about this, expressing your concerns? Sorry? Have you had any um, discussions, sorry, with um, the Agriculture Minister or the Industrial Relations Minister in recent times about your concerns about... Uh, our embassy has uh, compiled substantive uh, report to raise it. I know uh, the laws in Australia are good. But like in many countries, sometimes the enforcement of the laws uh, have a, a more difficult. Mm. Because there are always, uh, I say, unscrupulous uh, employers, and that's not only in Australia, elsewhere. So I know uh, we have raised it uh, with the Australian side, and uh, I hope that it will be uh, corrected. Because Australia, one thing is very well known about Australia, is very fair-minded country. And uh, so I believe that in due time, with due course, will change, will improve. Brad, Peter Harcher from the SMH and The Age. Uh, thank you. You mentioned that Ali Alatas, when he was the Foreign Minister of Indonesia, said that East Timor had nothing but rocks. Um, you're standing in a country which ourselves, we've had problems in Australia graduating beyond a rock-based economy. We call it iron ore and other minerals. We are still after two centuries riding the cycle of commodity exports. But can I ask you about uh, Timor Lest's plans? What are your economic plans and prospects beyond rocks, beyond greater sunrise, and beyond the labour mobility and remittances based uh, system that you've just referred to? What's the outlook? What are the plans? Thank you. Uh, we need uh, the ongoing uh, development of our non-renewable to, uh, to uh, help us doing the following, which we have been doing the last, I would say, since 2011, when we adopted the National Strategic Development Plan. It is a 20-year uh, program, 2011 to 2030. Our vision is what to achieve by 2030. Uh, to finance this strategic development plan, we needed the money, revenues from great, from by Undan. We have built thousands of kilometers of seal roads around the country. That's our own money from the petroleum fund, not from donors. Japan is, and Japan is the only one that built few kilometers. 90% of the road built by us. Australia has helped now more rural roads. That's very important. We are the ones who finance 100% this very expensive electrification of the country with uh, diesel. We could, uh, we could have done cheaper with uh, heavy, heavy, heavy fuel, heavy oil, you know, more uh, pollutant, but, and much cheaper. Indonesia, they're still using that. In West Timor, they use uh, heavy fuel. We are not using, we are using diesel, and we want to move to gas, at least cleaner. 
what we want to do, first build infrastructures, address uh, public health issues. We eliminated malaria. Malaria non-existent in Timor-Leste today. We still have dengue. Yesterday, WHO came with the news uh, that Timor-Leste is confirmed, have eliminated uh, filaria, uh, this uh, very, very debilitating disease. Uh, 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 that it, uh, it muski uh, carry by mosquito uh, enter into the bloodstream and they uh, very fast uh, the person is debilitated. This has been eliminated, confirmed. Already eliminated a few years ago, but only now. Uh, several years of uh, this disease not happening, it officially eliminated. Uh, <coughs> lepra. An ancient disease in Timor medically is already eliminated. However, there are still cases. Although, medically speaking, when you have less than a number per 10,000, it means medically uh, non, they no longer exist. <coughs> we want to move forward, you know, with uh, every person in the country having done nine year, uh, year nine school. We have one of the highest school enrollment in Asia, in the world, but drop out a lot. We still have a tremendous uh, level of child poverty, child malnutrition. We have uh, to address that. And to do all of that, that's why we need uh, the Greater Sunrise Development and the Development of Greater Sunrise. And let me add, you know, for many, many people misunderstand about Timor and uh, in some of the media. For instance, we are one of the few countries in the world with the lowest debt. Total debt we have is about 13% of our GDP. Maybe now 16%, as I understand. And none to any commercial bank. We owe nothing to commercial banks. The so-called uh, debt tra trap is more to Western commercial bank than to China. I, I, I tell you, the study just came out from uh, uh, Washington the, the Defense uh, Institute, a scholar there. He said, no, this is total nonsense to say. Uh, so that's the, uh, we owe zero to China in terms of debt. Our debt is primarily ADB, World Bank, and uh, IFC. Uh, so, what we want to, to, uh, to achieve? Uh, <coughs> uh, better roads, better communications. Uh, now with the submarine cable, by next year we have first class uh, telecommunications. Um, better health services and uh, gradually uh, improving, expanding the tourism industry. Uh, <coughs> so these are part of the al alternative to uh, re, uh, non uh, renewable. Thank you. Our final question today is from Cameron Carr from SBS. Hi there, Cameron Carr, SBS World News. Uh, in light of the current ASEAN summit and Timor Leste looking to become a full member, are there any key policies or directions you'd like to see the association taking currently and in the near future? Uh, sorry, can you... Did you want to repeat? Yes, no worries. Um, so Timor Leste is looking to become a full member of ASEAN. Yeah. Are there any key policies or strategies you'd like to see the association moving towards now or in the coming years? Joining ASEAN has been a long, long goal from us, at least from me. Way back when I first time ever in my life, I went to Jakarta, June 74. I was very young, inexperienced, broken English. I went to see pa Malik, Adam Malik. I went on a scooter. <laughs> I didn't want in a limo, didn't go in a limousine. I drove a scooter, Batchak in uh, Jakarta. <laughs> and uh, I talked with pa Malik about Timor Leste being independent in the future and they would join ASEAN. It doesn't take uh, you know, an Einstein to understand the importance of regional integration uh, and uh, and our own life, daily life, you know, it shows that thousands of our people uh, 
uh, travel back and forth to Indonesia, thousands of Indonesians living in Timor-Leste. So the easier we, we uh, move in the, uh, in the region, the better the, the region to an ASEAN. Uh, economic, trade, but also <coughs> diplomatic. Uh, we, uh, as a newcomer, and I have said, our main contribution, main obligation to ASEAN is that we remain a peaceful country, that Timor is peaceful, is stable, that we don't add to the challenges ASEAN facing, like with uh, Myanmar. And there's some people surprised that Timor is not joining ASEAN and already, not yet joining ASEAN, and already so outspoken on Myanmar. Wouldn't that affect uh, our uh, membership? No. ASEAN has changed a lot in the last years. We are not the only ones uh, being very outspoken on Myanmar. Indonesia is one of them. President uh, Widodo uh, is not very outspoken person, but I met with him. He was very upset when the Myanmar military, not listening to him, not listening even to Hun Sen of Cambodia, went ahead and executed four young people, the democracy uh, activists. Uh, so for us, yeah, first obligation, Timor must remain peaceful, stable, better still that we are prosperous, and that's what we will do and uh, we will benefit from joining ASEAN. And with that, please join me in thanking President Ramos Thank you.